Hey there! I'm excited to talk to you today about something a bit different than we've talked about in the past. Today's message actually comes from a message that I had been asked to uh, teach to a group of women. I had, had been asked to do a series of wisdom in one healing and wisdom into deliverance. And this message comes from the teaching I did on wisdom in deliverance. I, I think that it will really help us understand not only how to handle deliverance type issues, because many of you probably, maybe not probably, but many of you probably aren't all that interested in being a deliverance minister, right? But so, but this applies to how we handle whatever we've been called to do. And so before we get there, though, I think we need to just to kind of take a moment and look at some of the attitudes that a lot of Westerners have towards um, the supernatural in, in general and, and kind of who needs deliverance and, and why. And so I'll answer that question first. I think it, most everybody needs deliverance to some degree or another because we live in a fallen world, I personally um, have gone through deliverance and it's fabulous. Um, deliverance is not the end all be all. You don't get delivered and suddenly ah, everything is okay. You still have to work out all the habits that you developed while under the influence of these ugly spiritual entities. Um, but most everyone I know need some form of deliverance that, you know, it, being demonized doesn't mean that you are running naked, screaming down the street and, and manifest every time the Holy Spirit shows up. Um, it's not like that. There probably are people who have been through some extreme things that maybe that's their, their world. Um, We've met a couple of them, but generally speaking, most of us just have um, opened the door to influence, um, and these doors are, are opened uh, through trauma and uh, rejection of God, sin, um, sin against us, sin that we've done, you know, will, willfully done ourselves, and through ritual. And we often think, well, okay, wait a minute. <laughs> I don't do rituals. Well, of course you do. We all do rituals. Because what is a ritual but a repetitive act? So any act that we do repeatedly becomes a ritual. And so most of us have a lot of healthy rituals because we get up in the morning and we brush our teeth and we have our coffee and we do our little get ready routine to get out there in, in the world. And that is our I call it autopilot. You know, all these things that we've done so many times over and over again that we do on autopilot. Um, you know, driving home, oftentimes, you, 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 where am I? Because you're lost in thought and you're just kind of driving on autopilot because, you know, in some ways, the drive home is a ritual. You do it every single day, just the exact same way. Some of us shake things up a little bit, but most of us kind of do things habitually on purpose. And, and these, are, these are good rituals. It is good to brush your teeth every day. If you're not in that ritual, I suggest you get into it twice a day. I have my little bedtime rituals that when it's time to go to bed, I wash my face, brush my teeth, get the floss out, put my pajamas on. <sighs> But not all of these things that we do are positive. So again, thinking about a ritual being anything that, that we do by repeating an act over and over and over again, one time does not a ritual make, but these, these negative rituals um, and in these positive rituals, they build strongholds in our hearts. So we want to build a strong tower unto the Lord. Or are we giving the, the, uh, building a stronghold unto the enemy? So every time that we succumb at, to a negative ritual, what is a negative ritual? Fear. Every time that we 
bow down to fear and we listen to the lies that fear says. Don't do that. You will fail. Do not step out. People will make fun of you and you will look stupid. Don't go to the mailbox because something bad is going to happen to you. I mean, there's all different kinds of forms of fear and doubt, self-loathing, you know, listening to that voice that says, nobody likes you. Everybody hates you. You should go eat worms. Matter of fact, you are a worm. Okay. Every time we give in and we entertain this voice, whether it be fear, addiction, Okay, so addiction is that thing that we do whenever we seek to alleviate the pain in our soul from a source other than God. So what all kind of things can you be addicted to? You know, maybe you're addicted to Advil. Every time you feel a little pinch, you gotta you gotta run go take an Advil. Or maybe you're addicted to alcohol or drugs because you're trying to kill that pain in your soul. Or maybe you're addicted to work, ministry, art. Oh, we can be addicted to so many things. Anger. What happens if we just keep giving in to anger? That every time that, that something doesn't go our way or it becomes more complicated, you know, like I got to tell you, you know, I was starting to get really angry. I was trying to put a doorknob on um, a door that had never had a doorknob on it before. And this is above my skill set. And, and, and it looked, for, you know, and I think I get it all figured out and I'm, you know, but things just aren't coming together and I'm feeling frustrated. So what happens if every time I feel frustrated, I start throwing things and screaming and yelling and kicking the dog? You know, I'm building a ritual towards anger. And here's the thing that we have to understand. Every time that we participate in this ritual, a stronghold is being built in our hearts. So when we pre participate in rituals of gratitude, of adoration toward the God. Look at this tower that's building in our heart. But when we give in to these rituals of fear, anger, addiction, whatever they may be, we are actually, a ritual is a form of worship. So when I am doing a ritual of gratitude, Oh, Father, I am so grateful. I'm so grateful for you. I love you, Lord. Thank you so much for din last night's dinner. It was awesome. I'm so glad for that. And this morning I heard the birds chirping and it was just such beautiful music to my ears. And thank you, Lord, that I could actually fill up uh, um, my gas tank full of gas because it's so expensive right now. I just appreciate you. This is, this is build, building a stronghold unto the Lord in our hearts. It's because it's worship. It's a worship of the Lord. But when we continually listen and allow that ritual of every time that you start to step out in faith, don't do that. God's not going to show up for you. God doesn't even really like you. You better not do that. You're going to fail. It's a form of worship to the enemy. Have you ever thought of it that way? Because it is. And it sickens me to think how, how many times I've participated in, in this just demonic worship by listening to horrible things about myself and my own mind. And how many of you are, are, are sharing that same worship and you didn't even know that's what it was? But as we begin to see it for what it really is, we go, ah, no. And we don't want to come into agreement with it anymore. So we want to turn away from it. We want to, we want to flee. So how do we learn to walk in this? Because how do we overcome it? repentance how do we help other people see guys we have authority over the enemy jesus tells us this in the new testament 
He says, I've been given all the authority from the Father. Now that I am going to go, I'm going to send you the t your helper, the Holy Spirit, and, and all my authority I'm giving to you. Doesn't mean he doesn't still have it. He's just sharing it with us. So, so it's like when we come, we say like, it's like when I say I re in the name of Jesus, I rebuke you. It's like Jesus himself is saying, I rebuke you. So this is like really cool. Through me, Jesus is rebuking the enemy. And we, we so often get into this goofy idea that it's like there's this, this equal battle. My hands aren't even, are they? My, my, my depth perception is really off. But it's like this equal battle between, it's like, the battle's not equal, guys. I've said it before, but I really love the way that Chris Hodges puts it. He's, he's with um, Highlands Church out of Birmingham, Alabama. He says that when, when Satan, uh, when, when Jesus said that he saw Satan fall like lightning from the sky, that that is uh, when Satan had his rebellion with his third of the angels. And they're like, oh, we're going to come against God. And Kai was like, enough. And just like that, you know, like a flash of lightning, they all fall from the heavens. I mean, it was just like that. Guys, like, eh, no, nah, no. Nah. <laughs> and it's just done. Like, guys, this is the God we serve. He is so powerful and amazing. And he's never, ever, 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 ever going to leave you or forsake you. So how does this work? How do we, when, when we are overcoming things in our own lives, when we're trying to step out in ministry and God has called us to do things, how does this work? So let's take a look at the story with Elijah. Elijah. So Elijah's pretty cool prophet, right? You know, he's got a lot of major things going on. Ahab is the king. He's hooked up with Jezebel, and it is not pretty. They got all sorts of worshiping going on. And they're building all sorts of stronghold and altars, not only in their hearts, but it's like through the land. I mean, there's like physical manifestations of what's going on in the spirit world with this ugliness they got going on, this Ahab and Jezebel thing. So Satan, Satan, Elijah comes up to Ahab and he says, well, you know what? It's not going to rain anymore until I say so. I mean, that is bold, guys. I mean, <laughs> could you imagine walking up to the president of your country and going, by the way, I'm a prophet of God. You're doing some really abhorrent stuff. You're a stench. The things that you're doing are just a stench in the nostrils of God. So, it's just not going to rain until I say so. You might want to think about repenting. See you in a couple of months. I, I mean, that would just be a, a, an incredible boldness. And we, we really need to think about this because, see, rain is freakishly important. Because everything depends on whether you get sufficient and not too much, just the right amount of rain. Because without rain, you don't have water to drink. Your, your crops are going to fail. Too much rain, you're going to flood. The crops are going to fail. You're not going to have anything to eat. There's going to be famine. Rain is associated with survival. And, and Elijah has the the guts to come up to the king of the land, the most powerful person in, in, in his world, and go, it's not happening until I say so. But what happens between now and the time that he actually confronts these, these demonic prophets there's, there's, there's time. So even though that, that he had been released in part for his mission, there was still growth in things that needed to happen because he was not yet really completely 
ready to confront the powers in the principalities with which Ahab had aligned himself. So God sends Elijah to a brook at Cherith to be fed by nothing else other than ravens. So we have this, this, this vision of, you know, he's laying by this brook and these, these birds, big old black birds are bringing him food. Yay. Guys, do a little Google on the personality of a raven. Yes, ravens have personalities. They are greedy and stingy birds. They are not friendly. And so, so <laughs> God has chosen this greedy, stingy bird to come feed and provide for Elijah. But then it gets kind of more interesting and, and a little bit strenuous because the brook dries up. So now God does something even more peculiar and he sends him to the Gentiles to receive provision through a widowed woman who just happened to be destitute. So he said, see, land was everything because oh, I've done just this incredible story. I have to share it with you sometime about God's being attached to the actual land. And, and, and so the God of Israel is, is attached to the parameters of the country, the nation. Uh, okay. So when you leave those parameters, you are now entering into nations whose parameters have been fixed by God, but have also under the influence of other gods, little g's. Okay, and so leaving Israel was not a pleasant thing because you are now, you know, it's kind of like I'm walking out of the umbrella of God. And but God says, I'm sending you to this Gentile place. And so he he gets there, and um and, and, and this 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 woman who was so destitute that she is actually fixing what little little bit less left over she has. I'm trying to get this out. She's fixing it so she and her son can eat it and then they can just both die together. And this is who God picks to provide for Elijah in the foreign land. So here, what happens, you know, he blesses the jar. It never runs out. Everything's going great. And then her son dies. And she's like, are you kidding me? Like, who is your God that he sent here to, to you, you know, provide for us just to take my son anyway? We were prepared to die. And then you gave me hope and my son dies anyway. I mean, can you imagine how mad she must have been? And Elijah, that's not the God I serve. He stretches himself out on the boy and, 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 and he breathes the breath of God and the boy comes to life. So God used a stingy and greedy bird to feed Elijah. He provided for him in a foreign land, for a woman who had nothing. And then he's called upon to revive the dead. But get this, the land in which this widow lived was an area, it was within the area called Sidon, which just so happened to be none other than Jezebel's birthplace. And as a result, this place was full of demonic gods, her demonic gods. This is the very place where Jezebel learned to be Jezebel. And in her own hometown, surrounded by demonic worship, Elijah now has defeated the spirit of death. 
God provided for him out of nothing. And let me just tell you something. I don't care how destitute that you are. God can use you for provision for others because the more destitute you are, then the more you have to rely on him. Just think about it. If he would have, if God would have sent him to a rich king, then it would have been the rich king providing for him. But he sent her to this debt. He sent Elijah to this des destitute woman. It none other than God had to be providing. And as she accepted this role, she was blessed and had life. Accept the role that God has given you, but learn to walk in the appropriate timing. David was anointed king, but it was 16 years later before he was crowned king because David had many battles to fight to prepare himself to be king, to rule. Just as Elisha declared there was no rain. I'm coming against these evil gods that you serve. But he had to go through these series of events before he was actually ready to confront them. He was growing in faith. Now, he's defeated even death in the very midst of Jezebel's own hometown. He is ready to go and confront the principalities that dominated his homeland. Elijah had faith to partner with God to bring drought upon the land, but he needed wisdom to gain victory. We need faith and wisdom to come together. 1 Corinthians 10, 26 says, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Because the earth belongs to the Lord, we cannot cower in our rooms, afraid of the enemy, worshiping the enemy through fear, building strongholds in our hearts that he is just having a habit, just, just having a great time playing it, playing with the strongholds in our heart. Because God said that when the spirit of Elijah was being returned, remember, remember in the New Testament, it says the spirit of Elijah will be returned. He was saying that we are given the spiritual status to confront the evil altars that are affecting, affecting our lives, our spirits, our towns, our families. And guys, it's time we get off the sofa and get the job done. But we've got to grow in faith and, and partner with wisdom to do it. We've got to remember some important points. we got to be ready for the battle. we got to learn this readiness, readiness by what? Obedience. And obedience teaches us to truly trust in the Lord and destroy these evil altars in our own lives. Remember that scripture teaches us that an altar divided, a house divided against itself will not stand. We cannot be partnering with our pet demons and expect to overcome him in the areas where it's just not so cool. Okay, so I, I want to, oh, I'm not liking this demon that, that's, that, that's tormenting me and, and causing me to, I don't know, um, to, to cower in fear. But I kind of like the angry one. You know, that's kind of working for me a little bit. Uh-uh. Yeah, we don't want to partner with the enemy anymore. Um. But one of the things that I want to get at is about having a healthy respect for the process and how this thing works. Because I see so many deliverance ministers now, it, it's like laughing and mocking demonic spirits. And I'm just not thinking this is wisdom, guys. We want to walk in wisdom. Because Luke 10, 20 says, However, you should not rejoice in this, that the demons are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. 
So do you get that? It says, rejoice that your names are written in heaven. So rejoicing in the fact that our names are written in the Lamb's book of life results in gratitude and humility. But rejoicing that the demons are subject to us, which they are through our authority in Christ, but rejoicing in it leads us to pride and arrogance. And these things are not good. And so one of the scriptures that caused me a lot of consternation because I was introduced to this scripture out of context, uh, it came from Jude. It said, yet in the same way, these people also dreaming, in other words, you're dreaming, you're out of your mind, defile the flesh, reject authority, and speak abusively of angelic majesties. But Michael the archangel, when he disputed with the devil, and argued about the body of Moses, did not pronounce against him an abusive judgment, but said, the Lord rebuke you. Now, this language is very... First off, wait, before I go there, I want you to notice that, that, that we're talking about angelic maj majesties and immediately followed up with Michael um, addressing Satan. And so, you know, Satan is an angelic being. Not a good one, right? But... He was originally an angel. He's a fallen angel now, but he is a, a you know, he, he was created as a majest, majestic being. And, and the language here, when, when Michael is arguing with Satan, he says, the Lord rebuke you, which mirrors in Zechariah 3, 1, when Joshua is standing before the high priest and Satan comes along and he starts to make accusations against Joshua, the angelic being there said, may the Lord rebuke you. So we, we, we see, see this, the, the similarity and, and what I was taught and in, in introduced to in Jude was that we do not directly confront demonic beings. And this brought me some consternation and some confusion. And so it's like, well, wait a minute. Does that apply to garden variety demons? Or are we talking about principalities? Because actually in this context, he was talking you know, directly to Satan. What's going on here? So I just had to kind of cast aside what everybody had to say to me about this and, and do some digging and some research. And I found some kind of you know interesting stuff here. Um, I began to understand that in this context, um, it's not saying kind of exactly what we, what we think it was saying. So again, remember to truly understand what a scripture is saying. What was the original writer intending to his original audience? Well, what did they know that maybe we don't know about the circumstances between what, what this was written and what was he trying to say? Because if we're trying to make it say something that the original writer wasn't intended to say, we probably are not right, Okay. Do you want someone to put words in your mouth? I'm sure Jude doesn't want us to put words in his mouth either. So as I, I prayed and looked into this verse, verse I, I began to understand it better considering in, in the context. And so Jude was actually writing against false teachers who were rejecting authority. False teachers who are rejecting authority. So one of the things that we really want to do is, is we want to stay aligned with that strong tower with Jesus by respecting the authorities uh, that God has placed us under. Okay? Because respecting authority is a godly thing. Um, now, Jude was teaching us to respect earthly authority just as the angels respect authority and do not act upon their own authority but on the upon the authority given to them by God see we are acting upon the authority given to us through Christ okay that's way better than our own authority uh, uh, okay because it's like when I when I say in the name of Jesus I rebuke you it's Jesus himself is rebuking you right so this, this Jude is explaining this point uh, 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 and and these false teachers what happened is they were coming through and they were ridiculing angelic powers which most likely included Satan 
And see, this is where I come back. When these deliverance ministers are ridiculing and mocking demons, do not think that this is a godly practice. It, it, it's almost like, you know, just being a jerk about about the authority that God has given you. It, it, you know, it's like being a pantulate child. My mama said, you know, it's like, come on, that this is not, you know, this is not mature Christianity. So Peter talks about this actually in um, Peter 2.10, 1 Peter 2.10, I believe it is. The dead, and see, the Dead Sea Scrolls um, taught to us and taught us that there, there was a form of spiritual warfare that was occurring at this time where people were cursing demons and even Satan. And, and, and see, this is a, just a, a disrespect for the enemy. Respecting someone's power and position does not mean that we are honoring them. We do not honor demonic entities, but we do need to respect the power and authority that, that they are currently operating under, even as we are removing it. From, from our own lives. So just as Michael chose his words carefully, because scriptures tell us that Michael chose his word carefully, we need to choose our own words carefully. We need to do the job, but we don't need to revel in it, nor make fun, nor curse demons. So Craig Keener uh, teaches that this, he's a spirit-filled biblical scholar, is what I'm trying to say here. And he says that this attitude reflect re, actually reflects a, just a, a flagrant disrespect of authority in general. And it is because you're, you're, you're abusing the authority that God has given you. And we, we don't want to do that. And so in, in failure to respect authority is going to open us up to harm. And uh, he shares a rabbinic story about a man who repeatedly ran around making fun of the devil. And finally, one day, the guy's like, in the marketplace and the devil shows up, chases him into the bathroom and teaches him a very valuable lesson. Sure, that was not pleasant. So wisdom in deliverance, any type of ministry, even just walking in wisdom in our own personal lives includes obedience. The obedience of faith, yes, Lord, respecting authority and the respect of the process and the respect of all individuals involved. We, we do not treat the enemy as an object of ridicule. It is, it is wisdom for us to walk in the Psalms 91 protection of God because this isn't a prayer that we just magically pray. Okay, I'm, I'm, in, I'm, in the, I'm, I'm praying, I'm putting on the full armor of God. And I said the prayer. I think that that's an empty ritual. Saying in this protection, putting on the full armor of God, Psalms 91 protection, it all, it all denotes an intimacy of relationship with God. See, Elijah, he walked in authority. But he needed to learn and he grew in greater intimacy with God through, through this season before he was able to confront the higher principalities in, in, his, in his region. I'm not discouraging you from kicking the devil to the doorstep out of your own life. I'm encouraging you to do it quickly and in obedience of faith and a respect of authority. Our focus at all times must be upon Jesus. Failure to fix our eyes on Jesus will open the door to our, uh, you know, our high gates, um, to, to the object of our focus. Whatever we focus upon will always appear bigger than Jesus, is Jesus is not our focus. And so, just on a side note, do not engage in spiritual warfare with principalities over your cities, towns, and regions, unless you have specifically been called to do it, and unless that you are fully prepared and have a prayer covering and intercessors surrounding you to do it. That is tame work. You do not go out and do this sort of thing as the Lone Ranger. 
Jesus has to be our focus. And we don't touch God's glory by taking credit for kicking the enemy to the curb. So we want we want to we want to acknowledge that the fact in our own lives that we have been building altars, evil altars within our heart by worshiping the enemy through repeated actions and repeated thoughts over and over again and ask the Lord to show us what, what they are so that we can destroy these evil altars. And as we go forth in what God has called us to do, we want to appreciate the process. We don't want to go, okay, I've been called, you know, and jump all the way to, to plan C. We have to go through the process and we have to be willing to let God deal with our hearts and teach us along the way. Because even with the incredible faith of Elijah to say it will not rain, he still had much to learn, and so do we. So, Father, I pray right now that, that you send this message to pierce our heart and allow our hearts to receive it in your wisdom and let anything else just fall to the wayside. Father, I ask that you give that you give us courage to, to confront and acknowledge the own evil altars that we have erected in our hearts. Lord, whether they're generational things that we've learned from our family that, that we have come into agreement with or, or that we just embraced out of fear, hurt, pain, anxiety, whatever it may be. But Lord, let us confront that and be set free. Lord, give us wisdom to respect the process. Give us wisdom to respect our enemy and courage to overcome him in faith and the authority that Jesus has given us. Lord, let us no longer be impotent warriors sitting on the sidelines in fear and doubt, but Father, or, or impotent warriors because we have been going out in a false pride and bravado that does not speak of respecting the authority that Jesus has given us. But Father, let us be warriors of wisdom who respect authority and go out and overcome in the name of Jesus. Amen.